In the quiet village shadows, Gladys Deacon wandered, a figure so haunting that she only dared grace the cobblestone paths under the cloak of night. With her unkempt hair and toothless grimace, she starkly contrasted the villagers' mundane lives, her presence wrapped in a boiler suit held together by mere sacking. The once vibrant straw hat on her head and the peculiar patched Wellington boots did little to mask the hardship etched into her face. Local history had painted her as a spectre, a witch provoking the village boys to assault her sanctuary with stones. In a rare act of defiance, Gladys had brandished a shotgun at her tormentors, fueling rumours and fear alike, though she swore the weapon was harmless. Shrouded in mystery, this woman chose isolation, a stark departure from her rumoured past. Once a siren of the elite, her beauty had ensnared the hearts of princes and noblemen securing her a place in the grandeur of Blenheim. Now reduced to whispers and wary glances, she was a relic of a bygone era, a splendour lost to time. To stumble upon this enigma, driven by a curiosity that wouldn't rest, how had the world's most beautiful woman spiralled into the village phantom, and what tragedy had stolen her from the spotlight of high society? We are compelled to unravel this mystery to seek traces of the elusive Gladys, her old abode held no answers but a hint from the local public as they spoke of a Mrs. Spencer, a whisper of a woman who once was now a shadow in a distant hospital. What secrets lay buried in her past and could they still be unearthed? The quest for Gladys Deacon's truth was beginning. Mrs. Spencer was inside St. Andrews' Psychiatric Hospital, where she was known by her formal title, the Duchess of Marlborough. At 94, time was slipping through her fingers for anyone to understand her staggering narrative. Staff at the hospital warned visitors. She may not be a sight for sore eyes, but her gaze is unforgettable. Beware though, the Duchess can be whimsical, sometimes even claiming her own demise. Gladys's early life could have leapt from the pages of a classic fictional novel. Born to wealthy idle Americans who flitted across Europe, her life was a whirlwind of luxury until disaster struck in 1892. At 11, her world imploded in Cannes where her father, suspecting infidelity, shot a man hidden behind a couch in her mother's hotel room. The lover caught mid-dress and bled out within hours. The scandal was notorious in snaring the Deacon family in public disgrace. The tale caught Henry James's attention, fueling his creative fire. Meanwhile, Mr. Deacon, having served a scant sentence, reclaimed his daughters, leaving their mother to her continental escapades. But Gladys, the eldest, was more than just a beauty, with her captivating azure eyes and golden locks. She was a mind in motion, devouring knowledge, mastering languages, and delving into mathematics, a tutor proclaiming her a prodigy. Yet her dreams stretched beyond academia. In 1895, a newspaper article about the Duke of Marlborough's engagement caught her eye, igniting a youthful fancy. If only I were older, she mused to her mother, I might still ensnare him. But youth and naivety were her companions, not the seasoned allure she yearned for. To what turn would her life take from this whimsical dream? For Gladys, the union of Consuelo Vanderbilt and the Duke of Marlborough was not just a marriage but a benchmark of aspirational grandeur. The Duke was lauded as the pinnacle of marital prospects on the American East Coast, his bride to be an embodiment of wealth and impending nobility. It ignited a fire in Gladys, longing to eclipse Consuelo, though the two had never met. She devoured every snippet of information about the heiress, fueling a silent rivalry. The death of Mr. Deacon in 1901 with a legacy of $200,000 to each child opened the gates of European high society to Gladys. Despite the dark shadow of her family's past, the elite of England, France and Italy embraced her with open arms. Her allure, paired with her sharp weight, made her an instant favourite.
Gladys's story inspired novel characters and captured the attention of Giovanni Baldini, a renowned portraitist who immortalised her in his work. Even at the tender age of 16, she left a trail of smitten admirers, including the esteemed art critic Bernard Berenson, whose affection for Gladys was such that it stirred no jealousy in his wife Mary, who too fell under Gladys's spell. By 1901, at 20, her mother fretted over her daughter's dismissed marital proposals, but Gladys's heart was set on a distant dream, the Duke of Marlborough. Her acquaintance with him and his wife Consuelo had only deepened her infatuation. Consuelo herself couldn't help but be captivated by Gladys's charm and eloquent conversation, admitting of being utterly taken by her presence. So what made Gladys so irresistible? And how would her fixation on the Duke shape her destiny? Gladys's tale became entangled with that of the Marlboroughs as their marriage faltered, weighed down by Consuelo's apparent contempt for a union she had never desired. Forced into wedlock by her family's ambitions, she had confessed to her husband, nicknamed Sonny, her aversion to further intimacy. In this troubled atmosphere, Gladys, an habitual traveller like her mother, made her first of many visits to Blenheim Palace in 1901, offering the couple a diversion from their unhappy marriage. During these visits, she captivated Crown Prince Wilhelm of Prussia, sparking an ill-fated love that enraged his father, the Kaiser, demanding he marry royalty instead. The scandal of the smitten prince catapulted Gladys into the global spotlight, inspiring a Miss Deacon dress-up doll that became a peculiar symbol of her fame. Her bond with Consuelo deepened into an intimate friendship marked by letters filled with endearments unusual for the time. The Marlboroughs, in turn, introduced Gladys into the whirlwind of London's elite circles. Adored across Europe, Gladys attracted many admirers, from nobility to diplomats. The constant adulation could overwhelm any young woman, leading her to moments of vanity, lying on her bed, lost in the reflection of her beauty. Perhaps this vanity led her to a radical decision, to alter a minor imperfection on her face. Inspired by the classical proportions observed in Roman statues, she underwent a procedure to inject paraffin wax into her forehead. It was meant to enhance her beauty, but the process ended in disaster, as the wax moved erratically, altering her once admired features beyond recognition. As whispers and rumours spread through the social circles, Gladys faced a new unintended notoriety. What would now become of her in a society that had once revered her beauty above all else? Rumours swirled around Gladys. Despite this, her allure remained undiminished, captivating all who crossed their path. Her circle wasn't just composed of admirers and included the era's most celebrated minds. Rodin's sculptures, Monet's brushstrokes and Proust's prose were all part of her world. Proust himself was enchanted, declaring her unmatched in beauty and spirit. However, by 1906, Gladys's relationship with the Marlboroughs had shifted. The once warm bond with Consuela had cooled amid false whispers that Gladys had been a home wrecker, a claim belied by her loyalty in destroying potentially scandalous correspondence from Consuela. Yet in a twist of fate, Gladys found herself consoling the Duke in Paris, her mother prematurely boasting of an imminent engagement, but Consuelo's refusal to divorce obstructed the path to Gladys's childhood dream, a stance she maintained until her desires led her elsewhere. Meanwhile, Gladys continued her delicate dance of dalliances, her heart set on one elusive prize, the title of Duchess of Marlborough. Their drawn-out liaison culminated in marriage in Paris in 1921. By then, Gladys was 40, though official records might suggest otherwise. Ascending to the role of Mistress of Blenheim, she commanded an extensive household, yet lamented the estate's antiquated comforts. Her new life blended grandeur and pragmatism, starkly contrasting her former existence. So what now lay ahead for Gladys? 
in this grand yet challenging new world. Gladys found herself out of step from the very beginning. The cold reception from Lord Blanford, the eldest son and heir, was just the start. The local villagers, estate workers and the elite of Oxfordshire who had harboured affection for Consuela were indifferent or outright hostile to the new Duchess, her peculiar ways doing little to endear her to them. Personal losses and a growing sense of isolation marred her transition. Gladys confided in her journal that Autumn at Blenheim felt oppressive, dominated by insipid conversations on hunting and the dreary company. Her husband, once a figure of aspiration, revealed himself as a pompous boar. An incident with the headkeeper underscored the Duke's disdain for those he deemed beneath him, deepening Gladys's disillusionment. She sought solace in the gardens, pruning roses and tending to the rockery. Yet these distractions could have masked the crumbling facade of her marriage. By December 1922, the silence of the palace echoed her loneliness. Her journal entries becoming reflections of her disillusionment with her husband's indifference. By 1925, her letters voiced a bleak resignation to the arduous enterprise of marriage, equating it to a loss of self, a life as flat and as numbing as the endless step. Her patience frayed, leading to outbursts that shattered the decorum of aristocratic dinners. One evening, she silenced the Duke with a scathing critique of his political ignorance, claiming her scandalous liaisons gave her more authority. On another occasion, she unnerved the guests by casually placing a revolver on the table, hinting at darker thoughts. The Duke retreated to London, indulging in brief affairs, and in 1932 severed ties with Gladys completely, taking with him the core of the household staff. The departure marked the dismal end of a union that spanned over now three decades, leaving Gladys to ponder the ruins of her once grand aspirations. So what would become of her now, stripped of her role and abandoned in Blenheim's vast, empty halls? Isolated in the palace's grandeur, Gladys was shrouded in despair, while Sonny, ever vindictive, whispered to all who would listen, that she had lost her mind. His cruelty escalated, plotting her removal from their shared home, leaving her only the bleak hospitality of a hotel room. At 52, refusing to be branded as mad, Gladys made a dignified return to the social world, a silent defiance against her husband's allegations. But her resilience was met with rage when she dared to claim space in their London home upon Sonny's temporary retreat to Blenheim. Her home became a battlefield, Sonny dispatched men to seal away essentials and cut off utilities, an act of war against domestic peace. In desperation, Gladys sought legal escape, filing for divorce to miss claims of Sonny's relentless cruelty. However, the Duke's untimely death from cancer altered the proceedings, cloaking her future in uncertainty. Now the Dowager Duchess Gladys faded from the public eye, adopting Mrs. Spencer as a cloak of anonymity and retreating to her tranquility of rural life. Her days were filled with simple pleasures and solitude, contrasting sharply with her past opulence. World events unfolded around her unnoticed, her nonchalance towards the Black House during the war and disdain for Winston Churchill's prominence reflected her detachment and former grandeur. She stumbled upon a young Polish labourer. Andrzej Kwiatkowski into this quiet existence in 1951. Initially kept at arm's length, he would soon become her reluctant confidant, a witness to the remnants of her storied past and the touch of Russian nobility to her sharp insights on fleeting friendships. Her historical secrets would now unfold from a woman's lips who had seen the heights of glory and the depths of solitude. Andre's arrival shifted Gladys's secluded life, enabling her to retreat further from the world. Instructions for daily necessities were silently communicated through notes left on a blackboard under the cloak of night. The house, veiled in heavy black drapes, became her sanctuary, safeguarded annually by Andre's dutiful oiling against the 
Moth's silent invasion, all encased by a fortress of wire fencing. The rare intrusion of family concern came in 1960, when Sir Shane Leslie, a distant relative through marriage, visited, leaving with mixed observations of her impoverished state, yet dismissing claims of her insanity. As time wore on, Gladys's physical fragility necessitated more personal care, culminating in a dramatic and reluctant removal to a psychiatric facility in 1962, instigated by a concerned nephew wary of the potential loss of both her and their inheritance. Despite her isolation, Gladys's spirit remained untamed, evidenced by her repeated attempts to escape. Andre, ever loyal, stood as a steadfast link to the outside world, contrasting sharply with their family's apparent materialistic concerns. Their betrayal deepened with the clandestine clearance of her home, uncovering hidden treasures amidst the mundane chaos, highlighting the overlooked value of her accumulated life. In the hospital, Gladys maintained her distance from other patients, finding solace in the company of pigeons who seemed to understand her solitude better than her human counterparts. Yet even at the grand old age of 94, she was a formidable presence, her clarity and engagement with the world undimmed despite her reclusive years. Her interactions were cautious, revealing fragments of her past, only to retract them, guarding her narrative like a precious jewel. The dismissal of her former self as if she were a ghost of the past. Gladys Deacon, she never existed, echoed a life of contradictions, a tale penned in whispers and silences. Her death marked the end of an enigmatic existence. Still, even in the aftermath, her legacy sparkled under the hammer. Her possessions, and in particular, an historic tiara, fetched a fortune. A silent testament to her life and the mistress she took with her to the grave.